are all musicians narcissists? And what about this one who was recently accused of boundless narcissism in the YouTube comments section? Is she a narcissist? Well, as a professional who is qualified to make that judgment, I'm going to react to Mary Spender's recent video about being called a narcissist and stay tuned to the end where I will give you my professional opinion as a clinical psychologist on Mary Spender's narcissism. Some of you might have seen and enjoyed my trio videos over the past year. Those are a lot of fun to come up with. Give me some time alone in a room with a camera and I can amuse myself no end. One kind, thoughtful comment about one trio cover song got me thinking. Your narcissism knows no bounds. Now, that's an interesting topic. Is there a link between creativity and narcissism? And no, this isn't the first time I've been called narcissistic. However, are creatives and maybe musicians in particular narcissists? As always, I have tried to do my research, but I am new to this topic. So check out my bibliography in the comments below. And of course, thank you to my trusty friend, Wikipedia. In Greek mythology, Narcissus was a hunter blessed with exceptional beauty. He spurns the romantic advances of the nymph Echo and is punished by the gods for his arrogance. They make him fall in love with his own reflection as he gazes into a pool of water. He eventually dies from unrequited love. So narcissism is a personality style characterized by an excessive need for attention and admiration, an exaggerated sense of self-importance and self-absorption. I can't blame Mary for using this definition of narcissism. It's from the American Psychological Association. But in this instance, the American Psychological Association have got it wrong about narcissism. Or at the very least, they're presenting a narrow definition of narcissism in this quotation. The concept of narcissism has evolved considerably over the last century and a quarter. And understanding that wider picture is probably very helpful in answering Mary's questions about narcissism in musicians. The term narcissism was first used by Ellis Havelock to describe a patient who was engaging in autoerotic activity. That's self-stimulation. The term was taken up by Freud, who rather unusually for Freud, completely desexualized it. Freud saw narcissism as an ordinary stage of human development, in which a little child becomes enthralled and enamored by their ability to do things and to exert influence on others. However, for Freud, narcissism is a state of immaturity. Eventually, the child comes to understand that other people have thoughts, feelings and agency too. And in so doing, they learn how to relate and engage in reciprocal relationships. My favorite quote from all of Freud's writing comes from his essay on narcissism. Whoever loves becomes humble. After Freud, two giants in the field of narcissism emerge. Heinz Kohart, who worked in Vienna at the turn of the 20th century. At the time, Vienna was a buzzing city, a center for music and the performing arts. And many of Kohart's private patients were performers. Kohart viewed narcissism as an essential human experience and even something that can be rather fun if played with, but not something to get carried away with. For Kohart, narcissism becomes unhelpful when greatness and grandiosity are used as a crutch to compensate for an underlying insecure and unstable sense of self. This results in hypersensitivity to criticism and a need for constant praise and admiration. The second giant is Otto Kernberg. Kernberg was born in Vienna and he lived through the rise of the Third Reich. His family fled Europe to Chile to escape Nazi occupation and Kernberg worked in public hospitals with patients who had tendencies towards violence and aggression. Kernberg was only too aware of the dangers of envy, power, dehumanization and violence from both his patients and his broader experiences in the world. Kernberg developed the terrifying concept of the malignant narcissist, one who has no concern for the needs or feelings of others and uses them solely to meet their own needs. Kernberg's view of the malignant narcissist overlaps with psychopathy and Machiavellianism and is very different from the picture given by Heinz Kohut. Now, Kernberg and Kohut both recognized a spectrum of narcissism and neither denied that the other person's vision of a narcissist exists. Kohut sadly died from cancer in 1981, leaving Otto Kernberg's ideas to dominate the field and take hold in public consciousness. However, this cultural understanding of narcissism is far from the whole story. Craig Malkin, author of the book Rethinking Narcissism, defines narcissism 
as the human drive to want to feel special and to stand out from the 7 billion other people we share the planet with. He views narcissism as existing on a spectrum from very low to very high with a very healthy middle ground. Bear these differing concepts of narcissism in mind when you listen to what Mary says next about narcissism in musicians. Many musicians pick up that guitar or microphone because they harbour fantasies of global success and critical adoration. And having the confidence to put work out into the world suggests that you believe you have something worth saying, something unique or insightful. Consider the phrase blowing your own trumpet. Performing on stage suggests you enjoy attention, the thrill of eyes on you, and that you have the self-confidence to command a crowd. What Mary is describing here sounds a lot more like Heinz Kohut's vision of a narcissist than Otto Kernberg's. And there is a concept in the wider literature of adaptive grandiosity. As Mary points out, to perform, to write a novel, to start a business, even to make a YouTube video, we have to believe that we have something of value to others to give. We have to have a belief in our own greatness and a conviction in our capacity to achieve it. This kind of grandiosity is essential to human creativity and ingenuity. Where would we be without those people who had the audacity to dream big dreams and the courage of their convictions to pursue those dreams? Not all musicians are narcissists, of course, but some do appear to have developed quite the god complex. Billy Corgan, Bono, Michael Jackson, never more so than in Earth Song. The exception, of course, is Lemmy, who, as we all know, actually is God. Narcissism is measured with a test called the Narcissistic Personality Inventory, where users choose between 40 pairs of statements like, when people compliment me, I sometimes get embarrassed, versus, I know that I am good because everybody keeps telling me so. A higher score indicates greater levels of narcissism. Some interesting things about the Narcissistic Personality Inventory it doesn't measure narcissistic personality disorder. It measures narcissism. People who score highly on the NPI are more likely to be aggressive in response to any perceived threat to their self-esteem. And they exhibit more interpersonal dominance and less warmth and affiliativeness. But low scores on the NPI can be just as problematic. They're associated with depression, anxiety, low self-esteem and a lack of agency. Far from pursuing a vision of grandiose greatness, someone who is very low in narcissism may lack a conviction in their own abilities and may struggle to take any action at all because they don't have enough confidence in themselves and their ability to achieve the things that may be important to them. Someone whose narcissism is in the healthy range may view themselves through rose-tinted glasses. They may have a slightly more positive than justified view of themselves and their ability. But that perspective gives them agency and the willingness to act on their convictions in order to achieve their goals. However, if their narcissism is in the healthy range, it also allows them to sustain a stable sense of self-esteem through the inevitable setbacks and failures and frustrations that come with innovation. They're also able to accept and make use of constructive feedback and criticism without becoming overly crushed by it. And this makes them resilient and capable of learning and much more likely to achieve their goals. Someone who has excessive levels of narcissism isn't wearing rose-tinted glasses. They're completely completely blinded by their grandiosity. They're much more likely to become sullen or aggressive in response to constructive criticism. Setbacks and failures are crushing and may result in the highly narcissistic person blaming everybody else, unable to reflect, learn and grow. In its extreme form, it can manifest as a mental illness, Narcissistic Personality Disorder, NPD. Patients with NPD are hypersensitive to criticism, possess an intense need for admiration and validation and have an impaired ability to to recognize facial expressions and a compromised ability to regulate their emotions among other traits. They often suffer from a sense of deep shame and insecurity, which they mask through exaggerating their own importance and criticizing those who question their talents, much like people who post on Reddit. The American Psychiatric Association says many highly successful individuals display personality traits that might be considered narcissistic only when these traits are inflexible, maladaptive and persisting and cause significant functional impairment or subjective distress do they constitute narcissistic personality disorder. This is exactly right. Narcissism itself is a normal and even rather fun aspect of human experience. It may even be essential for creativity and ingenuity. 
narcissistic personality disorder is the disorder of narcissism that can cause great damage not only to the person who's experiencing it, but to those around them. A high regard for one's own talents and an excessive need for attention sounds like the perfect recipe for being a performer. Creativity is a complex construct, a mix of an openness to risk-taking, divergent thinking, emotional expression, adaptability and collaboration. There's a social aspect too. There's definitely crossover, although empathy, the ability to recognise and sympathise with the feelings of another, which is missing from narcissistic personalities, is one of creativity's key ingredients. Narcissists are often charismatic, enthusiastic and energetic, all traits that are closely associated with a creative personality. But there's a fine line between healthy self-esteem and self-confidence in your work and being self-absorbed and attention-seeking for its own sake. Pablo Picasso once said, God is really an artist like me. I am God. I am God. I am God. John Lennon famously said the Beatles were more popular than Jesus. In 1997, Noel Gallagher claimed Oasis were bigger than God, causing Mel C to respond saying, if Oasis are bigger than God, then what does that make the Spice Girls? Bigger than Buddha? Because we are a darn sight bigger than Oasis. That is a good one from Mel C. Now, are these expressions of obvious and blatant grandiosity? Well, they might be, but they may also be tongue-in-cheek and part of a performer's persona, so I choose not to draw any big judgments about people on these alone. Kanye West released a track called I Am A God on his Yeezus album. I am a god, so hurry up with my damn massage in a French-ass restaurant. Hurry up with my damn croissants. Okay, Kanye, that is pretty grandiose and not a small amount entitled. So my question would be, is this how he actually behaves or is it just lyrics for a song, for fun, for performance? Dr. Nathan DeWall, a professor of psychology at the University of Kentucky, analyzed three decades of pop hits between 1980 and 2007 and found narcissism is on the rise in lyrics as well as themes of loneliness and depression. He decided to study lyrics because they act as a mirror of cultural changes in personality traits and motivations and emotions. He found that over time, there's been an increasing focus on me and my in lyrics instead of we and our and us, as well as a rise in angry, negative, emotions rather than positive. This ties in with general societal change from the hippie collective peace and love generation to the me, me, me selfie generation. Now, it's important to take lyrics with a pinch of salt. Many are just tongue in cheek rather than a statement to be taken at face value. There are some really interesting cultural observations in this study. And whilst, like Mary, I suggest taking lyrics with a pinch of salt, I do think it's interesting that as we've become more polarized, more convinced of our own rightness and other people's wrongness, that we've also developed a bit of a cultural obsession with narcissism and calling people we disagree with narcissists. Now, when we do that, when we assume that the other person is wrong and therefore I don't have to listen to them, empathize with them, understand their point of view because they are in the box, the bad box of narcissists, I wonder if we're becoming much more narcissistic ourselves and not in the good sense of the word. We should also consider the fact that many entertainers' public personas are just that, a persona, a psychological suit of armour that they wear that can be quite different from their behaviour in private. Many musicians are actually quite shy and find performing an excruciating necessity to make ends meet rather than living for the stage. Nick Drake is a good example of this. He found performing so difficult to get through that he stopped playing live altogether. But are displays of narcissism an inevitable byproduct of possessing creative talents? Or do narcissists just think that they're more creative than others and proudly shout about it more? I'd be very interested in Mary's perspective on this, but the relentless demands on performers, on athletes, on people in the public eye, like politicians, to be constantly on, constantly performing at an exceptionally high level, often taking little time to rest, recover or attend to their own needs. Is that exactly the kind of environment where adaptive grandiosity might need to turn a little darker in order to sustain a person? Studies show that if ideas are pitched enthusiastically by a person with great charisma, they're often perceived as being more creative and original 
than they actually are. And in a group setting, narcissists can actually have a beneficial effect on the creative process because they are more forthright with contributing their ideas and less patient or polite while others are expressing theirs, often jumping back in with responses and therefore increasing the total number of ideas. This works up to a point until the ideas have to be put into practice. So if you're in a band, it actually might be useful to have a narcissist in the mix. Although, let's be honest, you probably do already. Someone at the high end of the middle ground, the healthy level of narcissism, may have a rose-tinted view of themselves, but evidence suggests they also have a rose-tinted view of others. They view their partners and people close to them, like their colleagues or their bandmates, in an equally positive light. Indeed, research suggests that this kind of positive illusion in relationships, seeing your partner as just a little more talented, a little more beautiful, a little more successful than by objective standards, is actually good for your relationship and is associated with more relationship satisfaction and longevity. A little sprinkling of this kind of grandiosity in a band or a team or a creative group may actually be beneficial, can be inspirational, encouraging those who may be on the lower end of the narcissistic spectrum to have more confidence in themselves and to pursue those big dreams. This can bring out the best in everyone and everyone comes along for the ride, achieving greatness together with a high level of mutual respect and appreciation. However, too much narcissism may result in people being placed on pedestals from which the only way is down. It can create teams driven by favoritism, conflict and teams that really people just cannot wait to leave. Someone who is pathologically high in narcissism may see other people in their team as existing solely to meet their needs and to serve their vision of greatness, rather than being able to recognize the unique contribution they may have to make and their dreams and visions of greatness that they may also want to pursue. So what about Mary herself? Is she a narcissist? Well, as a professional who is qualified to make that judgment, I also know that I can't possibly make a judgment about someone's underlying motivations on the basis of a YouTube video. And calling someone a narcissist is a cheap shot indeed. However, as an artist, Mary has found new and innovative ways to share music with the world, encourages and supports other artists to do the same. And from what I can see on YouTube and her trio videos, she certainly seems to be having a lot of fun doing it. So whatever narcissism Mary has is certainly working for her. So please do continue with your very self-involved trio videos because I, for one, find them really fun to watch. And if you're interested in wider issues around narcissism, you might want to check my other video looking at the narcissistic abuse industry and asking if it's more helpful or toxic.